It gives me great pleasure to bring Robert Skidowski up to tell us about Keynes and economic theory. Robert? I'm very happy to be back um, again among, uh, among the world's foremost gathering of this case. While we're on the gossip front, uh, uh, <laughs> let me add um, uh, a little bit of gossip of my own. Um, when, when I was commissioned to, to write um, a, a biography of Keynes, um, I had, there was an item in the Observer which um, so mentioned this fact, and its headline was Keynes Between the Sheets. So I was obviously just going to write a salacious, you know, salacious account of all his sexual adventures and so on. And I think, um, I think there was some surprise when it turned out not to be that, but a rather serious and uh, probing uh, account of his economics. Um, then Roy, ha uh, Roy, um, Roy Harrod's biography. Um, I assumed that I was the outsider here. Roy Harrod had written the official biography, and that Cambridge would be <coughs> Cambridge reception would be very, really quite hostile to the idea of me doing it. This one I was from Oxford, um, which uh, is always um, red rag to Cambridge people, um, and. Um, then I sort of didn't have any standing in, in, in economics. And um, so I wrote it. And then I got a letter from Richard Kahn. Now Richard Kahn was Keynes's favorite pupil and the inventor of the multiplier and uh, really the closest uh, to Keynes um, in, 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 in the development of the general theory. And I, I have that letter, and it's a long letter, and he was full of praise for my book. And he said, thank God that you wrote it after the awful Roy. And that was a reference to Roy Harrod's biography. And Cambridge hated Roy Harrod's biography. Not entirely clear why. They thought it was a bit dishonest, and there was a big cult of honesty. Um, and they also thought it was overwritten, um, and it, it, it is overwritten. I mean, Roy Harrod could write effectively. He was also a great economist. He could write effectively, but when he thought he was writing well, it was always overwritten. And I think there's a lot of purple horror in his in his um, uh, biography. Having said that, I did attack him in my biography for having omitted certain crucial details. Anyway, that's all the gossip. Um, uh, anyway, before starting on serious matters, I just want to say how uh, I would pay tribute to Landon Ro Rowland, um, who passed away earlier this year. Um, he was not only a very dear friend, but a staunch supporter of the post keynesian Conference over a number of years. Um, uh, he was a uh, um, uh, resident in Kansas City. Landon was responsible for one of the most extraordinary episodes in my life. We met in the year 2000. I had just written a long review article in the New York Review of Books on Karl Marx. And Landon rang me up um, from Kansas. He said he'd really liked my review and uh, could we have lunch together in London? And soon afterwards we did. Um, Landon was a lawyer who had been CEO of the Kansas City Railroad Company and was then CEO of Stillwell Financial, a spin-off from that company. At the end of the lunch in London, he said, I'd like you to join the board of Stillwell. Um, well, I was pretty gobsmacked, but managed, uh, well, thank you. Yeah, sure. Um, and he then said, we'll put you on the audit committee. So I said, but I'm not an accountant. 
He said, you'll learn soon enough. <laughs> and the deal was done. Well, it was my first real introduction to the business world. Still, it was about to be taken over by its main subsidiary, Janus, a big Denver-based mutual fund ju just listed on the stock exchange. It was one of the largest funds in the United States at, at that time. And for 10 years, Landon and I served together on the board of Janus. I should add, as a matter of detail, that when I joined the board, Janus stock was worth $45 a share, and when I left 10 years later, it was $12. <laughs> but e e in economics, you learn, or should learn, that a correlation is not a cause. <laughs> Um, I'll always be grateful to Landon Rowland, not only for, ten year, for years of friendship, but for allowing me an experience of business I would never otherwise have had, and as well as for creating the continuing and, for me, happiest link with Kansas City and the post-Keynesian conference. Um, so, what I thought I'd talk about tonight is a bit about my forthcoming book um, called Muddles in Macro, which I have subtitled Unsettled Issues in Me Macroeconomic Policy. You will see that I've stolen my subtitle from John Stuart Mill's famous essay of 1844. Um, in the history of economics, uh, Mill is an extremely interesting transitional figure. On the one side, he was the great consolidator of um, existing economic theory. On the other, he was riddled with doubts about some of its main propositions. He was a heretic on the side. And in his sights, in this particular essay, was Say's Law, which famously held that supply creates its own demand. Everything produced is bound to be bought. This seemed to rule out the possibility of what Mill called a general glut, a surplus of unsold commodities and labor. Yet economic life had exhibited periodic cycles of boom and bust. So how could this experience of real life, Mill asked, be reconciled with Say's law? Mill argued as follows in this essay. He was actually quite young, I think he was in his 20s. Um, Say's law, he says, depended on, a, I quit, a supposition of a state of barter. In barter, buying and selling are simultaneous, but money offers the possibility of postponing purchases. Such postponement of purchases arise, arises from a general anxiety about the future. So all that is produced in one period need not be bought. However, Mill goes on, if money, if money is a commodity like gold, as it was at the time, a general glut is bound to be temporary because an excess demand for gold will leave resources being switched to gold mining. Thus says law, stated Mill, that every increase of production creates, or rather constitutes its own demand, was a valid general principle. Well, I mean, it was a very clever essay. He raised the, the central problem and then got grounded by, by the device of treating money as a commodity, or a producing commodity. Mill's interrogation of Say's law came at the tail end of a major agricultural and industrial depression about the early 19th century, establishing a recurrent pattern of questioning existing economic theory when it cannot answer the question uppermost in people's minds. The same happened in the Great Depression of 1929-32, which gave rise to the Keynesian Revolution. And the same thing happened in the stagflationary 1970s, which produced monetarism. The same questioning has been taking place since the Great Recession of 2008, for according to the macro theory in power before 2008, a collapse of this magnitude could not have happened. It left in its way the general glut, which Say had deemed impossible, and it lasted for a long time, 
particularly in Europe, where it still continues. Nor was Mill's rescue of Say's law any longer possible, because today's money costs almost nothing to produce. So, why did no one see it coming? Asked Queen Elizabeth II of Great Britain, um, asked of a group of economists at the LSE. They couldn't give an answer. And um, one of them said, well, you know, it was a failure of collective imagination. Well, that's uh, one way of putting it. But basically, what use is the imagination? Of, uh, what use is e economics? It can't warn us that the world economy is about to crash. It seems a reasonable question to ask. So why did it happen? And that's part, part of what my book's going to be about, though not by any means the whole of it. It depends on where in the course of chain you start your explanation. The trigger was undoubtedly the collapse of the banking system and all the terrible things that the bankers were doing. But then the question is, why had the banks, or more generally financial services, been allowed to get into such a disgustingly under-regulated condition. This very soon takes one into the area of policy and the influence on policy of theory. What was it about mainstream macro theory as it was taught and practiced that enabled governments to take such a sanguine view of the stability of self-regulating self financial markets? I started this talk with Mill's critique, but I now want to say that throughout its history, economics has been bombarded by critics like Mill for the unrealism of its assumptions, the falsity of its conclusions, and its often damaging policy advice. Yet the house built by Adam Smith and his successors has remained standing recognizing the insane, despite endless new coats of paint, shell-shocked by countless disconfirmations, divided and subdivided into dozens of rooms to accommodate fresh generations of properly trained economics, it remains a glorious testimony to persistence. Its collective voice seems to me that of Luther at the Diet of Worms, here I stand, I can do no other, so help me God. I will not and cannot recant. And that seems to be the collective voice of the mainstream economic uh, profession as it has persisted through time. From which one might draw two conclusions. Either its foundations were well and truly laid, so critics have only been able to deliver glancing blows, or the method of abstraction and mathematical proofs perfected by economists is the only way to do the subject called economics, whatever its results, something we cling to for fear of drowning. And I don't know, what, and I think it's the second, but I mean, I'm not saying, you know, that some foundations are not well and truly made, but there's been this clinging to economics. It's the only way, what, the way they, the way people do economics is the only way it can be done. Um, and uh, that's something we've got to um, sort of, uh, uh, just, uh, just accept as axiomatic. And so deviations, they come and go, and many of the deviants actually come back to the fold sooner or later. Some remain heretics for, forever. But Mill's a good example of someone who deviates, but then always sort of comes back, because it's, it's too valuable. The main trunk of the subject is too valuable to be lost. Now, to descend from these rarefied heights, Models in macro, as I term them, start and end with money and government. They all see, stem from disputes about the part money and government play or should play in economic life jointly and separately. On the side of money, we, I, I, we start with a method of analysis well described by Schumpeter and attacked by Mill in his Unsettled Questions essay. Schumpeter writes as follows, real analysis proceeds from the principle that all the essential phenomena of economic life are capable of being described in terms of goods and services, of decisions about them, and of relations between them. Money enters only in the modest role of a technical device that has been adopted in order to facilitate transactions. 
this device can no doubt get out of order, but so long as it functions normally, it does not affect the economic process which behave in the same way as it would in a barter economy. To which Schumpeter opposed something he called monetary analysis, which, um, and I again quote him, spells denial of the proposition that with the exception of what may be called monetary disorders, the element of money is of secondary importance. One cannot go very far down this route Schumpeter says, without becoming aware of the fact that money processes that account for conspicuous disturbances don't cease to act even in the most normal course of economic life. Monetary analysis introduces money on the ground floor of our analytic structure and abandons the idea that all the essential features of economic life can be described by Walter models. Now, he, 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 Schumpeter contrasts these two views what I would like to assert is that the first method, analyzing the economic process by means of a barter economy model, has been the preferred method of economic analysis from Adam Smith's time to today. Money enters the elementary textbooks, I've read through some of them to just confirm this point, at about chapter six, far from the ground floor. And the DSGE models, used for macro modeling before 2008, left out banks and money. In other words, those very states of anxiety referred to by Mill. That is, they moved straight from individual maximization to optimal outcomes, barring surprises, completely neglecting the role of uncertainty. As Mill put it in his orthodox, doing his orthodox stuff. As he put it, money only exerts a distinct and independent influence of its own when it gets out of order. This is the crucial link to the role of government. In the first half of the 20th century, the view prevailed that it was the task of fiscal and monetary policy to keep money in order. But following Friedman's critique of Keynesian policy, the dominant view became that governments were in fact the source of the result. Government discretion to monkey about with the money supply was to be limited by making central banks independent. So, sorry, am I, is it from the wrong place? Well, I'm better, okay. Um, um, I mean, banks, setting them an inflation target and binding them to predictable operational rules. Fiscal discretion was removed entirely. <laughs> gets between me and what I want to say. Um, that was the macro policy. Um, that was the macro policy in power prior to 2008. The collapse of 2008 is testimony to the terrible power of uncontrolled money to shatter economies and the theories of economists and the deep flaws in the current theory of the state. So, how to understand, I come to the last part of my book, how to understand the mixture of scientific claims and ideology which make up the method and content of economics? Because they've always been there, both of them. That's the most difficult topic in the history of ideas. And I can only just sort of, um, very quickly give a flavor of how I think one should um, approach it. Let's start with ideas. Since the end of the Keynesian Revolution, economics has reverted to the classical belief in the smooth and rapid self. Are you all right? <laughs> Are you happy? Good. Um, yeah, what were you doing? <laughs> what? Have you always half your face? Only half of my face. I mean, am I looking the wrong way? Should I? I <laughs> don't too much that way. I should be looking more than this way. Sorry, sorry. I'll swivel from now onwards. Um, since, uh, yes, since the end of the Keynesian Revolution, the economics has reverted to the classical belief in smooth and rapid self-adjustment within the framework of, of thin institutions. And 
that that belief and, and that view of economies, um, um, the economists thought, has generally prevailed in practice and less subjected to discretionary interventions by governments in pursuit of political objectives. Um, the monetary and fiscal rules prescribe to tie down governments, exemplify this, as does the preference for life regulation. Now that seems to be seems to be the framework of ideas within which orthodox uh, economics, macroeconomics operated before the crash. And Roughly the frame, form the framework of economic or macroeconomic policy. But against this, one can assert, though not of course prove, that the collapse of 2008 wouldn't have happened had the system of financial regulation installed in the aftermath of the Great Depression not been dismantled. Had governments not left the management of aggregate demand to central banks, had governments not dismantled the trade unions, had they taken steps through the social security and tax system to control the growth of inequality. One can argue all that, and yet that argument has not won the day. Of course, economic ideas are not the only influence on policy. Ideology, the structure of power, the state of the world all play their part. In technical language, all four are independent variables. The analysis is further compl complicated by the fact that the independent variables are interdependent. Thinkers have tried to identify the ultimate variable. Um, but their choices, ideas, Hegel, the structure of power, Marx, the state of the world, Keynes, have failed to command universal assent. So, let's then go on to ideology. The reigning ideology since the end of the Keynesian era has been termed neoliberalism. Its watchword has been free up markets whenever possible and enjoy the benefits that brings. Now, here's an interesting coincidence, we can say correlation. The reemergence of classical theory in economics in the 1980s coincided with the neoliberal revival in politics. And I would say that the connection isn't fortuitous. Running through the story of scientific economics, and scientific inverted commas, is a deep suspicion of the state. The dominant view has been that government is a necessary evil, which steals resources from the productive sector and should be kept as small as possible. This view of the state was briefly set aside by the Keynesian Revolution, which was a response to the catastrophic labor markets in the 1930s. And it then revived after what was, in rational terms, much lesser failures of the Keynesian system in the 1970s. Much lesser failures. There were failures, but they were nothing compared to the failures in the 1930s. Yet, the suspicion of the state came back like that. Um, in other words, there was in economics a surplus hostility to the state, which took every example of state failure to justify the a priori disposition to lead it to the market. And I think one's got to recognize that as a genetic, a genetic condition in our discipline. Closely linked to the suspicion of government is suspicion of money. This lies deep in a value system that lords frugality and links money to extravagance and waste. In economic thought, thrift or saving works on both the economic and moral plane. The postponement of consumption today is what produces growth, and therefore greater consumption in the future, and virtue therefore is rewarded um, in the long run. But government represents extravagance. Um, when um, when um, Keynes wrote um, his first attack on the Treasury view in 1930, the Treasury uh, um, annotated his, uh, his essay with the words waste, extravagance, loss. That, is, that was their view of his, 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 his argument. That has, that has sort of persisted. 
Um, some of the most persistent thought of economists has been devoted to preventing money from escaping the limits set by thrift and productivity. And this, above all, took the form of trying to stop governments and later banks from manufacturing money. In short, money, like government, was denied a creative role in economic life. The fact that people paid and saved in money was supposed to make no difference to economic analysis. Now, the link between ideology and economics is complex and lends itself to crude reductionism. It's not that ideology, it's not that ideology distorts the conclusion of an argument. Ideology can't make proof valid or invalid. Rather, it invades the day the argument is set up the model, the core assumption of equilibrium, optimization, the choice of hypothesis and, and hypotheses and model variable, the selection of the relevant data. In short, the research programs which economists pursue, all infected by ideology. In this way, economics can display a strong ideological slant while sticking to the accepted canons of scientific inquiry. Its scientific method has served to protect it from the charge of ideological bias, this serves to power. Power. Ideology can't be regarded as our sole independent variable because ideology is highly influenced by the structure of power as well as helping to bring about a structure of power favorable to it. There's a great deal of truth in Marx's claim that the dominant ideas of any epoch are the ideas of the ruling class. The weakness of the claim lies in Marx's assumption that the ruling class is a monolith whereas in practice it's usually divided into conflicting interests. In economic life, between exporters and importers, for example, between creditors and debtors. A key matter here is how power is divided in a society. How balanced is the power structure between contending political and social groups, and especially between capitalists and workers, and the creditors and debtors. The more even the balance of forces, the less likely one is to get a single story about the way the economy works. And a central idea of all my writing on Keynes, and certainly in this book I've just written, is that the balance of forces between capital and labor from about the 1920s to the 1970s was such as to enable a policy of social conflict. In the last 40 years, though, that balance has been destroyed. Power has shifted decisively from the working, old working class to those with superior birth, wealth, and education, and from the old business elites to the new financial elites. And the main effect of this shift has been to marginalize pains in economics and to increase economic inequality. Neoliberal ideology accepts unequal incomes insofar as they can have been held to have been earned. But increased inequality makes economies more fragile. Now, the last, the last of, of, of my uh, possible um, independent variables: um, theory and policy are molded by the conditions of the time. And these produce what John Hicks calls called concentrations of attention. Concentrations of attention in the problems. The world changes and suddenly people are interested in a new set of problems. They've abandoned interest in the old problems. And that's sort of closely related to what Kuhn talks about as paradigm shifts. Though I'm not sure that there has been a genuine paradigm shift in economics, as I suggested earlier. I think Keynes was the nearest attempt, nearest, nearest has come to, and I think in the end he was spewed out. Um, but anyway, state of the world. Um, what causes such shifts in attention? Some assert that new industries create new paradigms, but the emergence of persisting unemployment in the 1930s, which produced the Keynes and Revolution, or of the inflation in the 1970s, which produced monetarism, can't be explained by technology. The shifts in parameters were more general than just uh, 
caused by technological innovation. Again, it's hard in any event to be sure of cause and effect, because some of the shift, famous shifts of tension in economic, economic theory occurred before the events which supposedly caused them. Um, you know, Friedman, Friedman, he told a story, and, but it, it wasn't a story that had happened already when he was, um, he was um, uh, drawing some conclusions um, from, from the facts of the 50s and 60s, because there wasn't a continuing process of inflation. I mean, there was inflation, but it wasn't accelerating. But he told the story of accelerating inflation before it had actually happened, and, and he got a lot of credit for that. So, again, other shifts of attention, if you think of marginalism, the not marginal revolution of the 1870s, um, was, it, was it caused by some change in the conditions of the world? Was it an internal revolution? I think it was a bit of both. Obviously, calculus uh, started to be used, and that is crucial. But it was also an attempt to refute the labor theory of value following the revolutions of 1848. And, 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 the, and the upsurge of socialism. So it, you have these sort of uh, complicated connections. So the last thing then, what's, what's to be done now? At root, the central question of political economy today, I think, is as it has always been. What does a government need to do to secure the relatively smooth and socially and morally tolerable functioning of a decentralized, money-using, privately-owned economy? That has been the question uh, uh, really all the way through, and it remains the central question. And to get to useful macroeconomic policy requires, as it has always required, but as it has all too rarely got, an economist who, as Keynes put it, should be mathematician, historian, statesman, philosopher, in some degree. No part of man's nature or institutions must be entirely outside it. Second is a very, a very strong possibility. But if one was to make it coherent, it's just the doctrine that independent banks should be independent, bank, central banks should be independent, and therefore not influenced by policy. And, and if you think the problem has been that governments have tended to inflate the money supply um, at will um, in, in order to suit political objectives, as Friedman claimed then one answer to that is to create independent central banks. So governments cannot have any influence on either the money supplies, freedom uh, itself, so or on the interest of the world. Give them an inflation target mandate, give them operational independence to pursue, and don't interfere. Now, of course, that also means that carries a corollary that if the government um, then 
uh, uh, starts running deficits, then the central bank acts against it to make sure that the supply doesn't increase. And that, that was the way they, 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 they thought about it. Now, I don't think they knew what they were doing, but I think that's the way the argument went. Says that he fully, um, fully acknowledges the weaknesses of 
monetary policy uh, in that law, but not his own culpability in any way, which is the future of life, that's the book Mark is about. Uh, but I, 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 I certainly wanted to think about you know, what <coughs> you know, the central bank, central bank thing was about in place. Central bank policy is a part of it, central bank existence of central bank banking is a part of this. Yeah, but he said it first. Yeah, 
politicians always borrow good phrases. And, uh, and it's interesting that in capitalism and freedom, we propose an emulation class. And I think that's consistent with the saying, we are all Keynes and God. Then he corrected and said, well, a little bit different from Keynes and Keynes. So much. My point is, in a certain way, who's not a Keynes? That is to say, the Republicans, they came strong, but they sure of course, spent a lot of money on the military. At on one level, one wonders, maybe they won't sit in the side of the Yeah, they said, the creative demand for gay, a foundation of promise. And it's so on. They're very, you, you raise very interesting questions. These are Keynesians by stealth, uh, but they don't admit it. Uh, uh, they don't use any theory. Over new games, but they still spend a lot of money, uh, government money. And America has always been totally conflicted about this. And you're absolutely right, a great deal of private enterprise has depended completely on government subsidy. And the Americans have actually, the federal governments have actually run quite large deficits for a long, long period of time. At the same time, while everyone is talking about the need to balance the budget. Um, and, um, so where does it come from? I mean, they, 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 uh, they, um, uh, uh, business, any business convention you'll hear, it's said that government is the problem, not the solution. And yet government is the, has been the solution to all their problems for a long time. Uh, I don't know how, is this what's called cognitive dissonance? Well, I think you might, uh, like, um, lovely, lovely, the status of people who, yeah. Well, one, one consequence of, of creating the myth that government is the problem is that it, it makes it more expensive to get the help of government to the rich. Yeah. Well, they're very, yeah, very self-interested in that. So they do that, they damn it. So they line up for it. And what is it the rest of the world say? Uh, uh, America maybe um, some, some, sometimes gets the best of both worlds in that sense. In, in England, we take consistency a bit more seriously, not much more seriously, but a bit more seriously. And, and usually, policy is, um, they try to give it a theoretical underpinning in a very, very simple way. For example, George Osborne mentioned the phrase Ricard in the <coughs> as, as a justification for his policy. And I remember taking part in a debate in Parliament. And the minister got up and said, you must realize that borrowing is simply deferred taxation. And you see, there was, there was a sort of, I don't know whether, you know, President Bush would have used that phrase. But I mean, on, on the whole, they do try and, and uh, try and uh, make, attempt to make their policies consistent with what they think it feels theory they believe in. And, but this may be a British reference. And I don't think it's going to be successful either, because unfortunately the effect of the wrong theory is that much greater. Question on the other side, please. Hi, I, I wanted to follow up on what Danny was uh, asking about earlier, because I think it's also something that's actually much more profound than just the question of whether the particular tools of monetary policy are affected or not. It's this, this fundamental feature of Orthodox Christianity, which is that on the one hand, we're told that real outcomes can't depend on money. As you say, as you say, we think that the insufficient notion of money, the monetary nature of the economy matters. But on the other hand, that if we're not happy with the real outcomes of the economy, we're not going to want only the tools of the monetary authority are, are achievable, are available. So it's a sort of profound contradiction of Orthodoxy. But I think it really goes beyond whether, you know, the federal budget or whatever is expected as a previous reason. And I, I, you know, obviously it's been papered over by the notion that you could achieve short run outcomes with a long run with the very policy purposes. I think what's very clear today, and what's interesting today, is how the, that, that sort of effort to paper over the contradiction is falling apart. And the central banks are being forced to intervene much more directly and aggressively in real outcomes. They're being forced to put aside the fiction that they can separate what they're doing from, from the actual organization and planning of the economy. And that leads me to sort of my, my question and maybe challenge to you. You end up saying that the basic issue is about the, the sort of stabilization of a private 
I don't think social art, socialism or central planning was really at the core of it. I mean, it was an element of it, but remember what central planning meant, people of this generation, it really meant sovereign planning. And he was never in favor of planning. So, let's discuss it later, right? and that's, that's the answer. They muddled up all the muddle. Um, but if they did it right, what would it be for for the muddle for? Is it that a statesman philosopher comes doing well, what would they do? I mean, I think they would be for two things if they got it right. One was actually, you know, in, in, in suggested in, in your session, um, which I, 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 I sat in on, both by you and, and by um, How you organize an economy? I mean, by what moral standards do you actually organize it? And then I think that is uh, a, a, a crucial, a crucial thing. In other words, morals apply to all areas of life, including the economic area. You can't just segregate economics out of it. And so the second point is well, what's the process directed towards? What's, what end state um, are we? Are we, are we thinking as a good end state uh, to which the, <coughs> the production of wealth is meant to be leading us? The Paynes wrote about this in the Economic Possibilities for Agriculture, a very short essay. It had uh, it to 10 pages, first delivered, first delivered to a group of schoolers. Now endlessly discussed by all people interested in automation, um, moral, moral, moral uh, ethics, um, and uh, uh, several volumes have already been published on it, including one of mine. Um, just brilliant, brilliant, brilliant sort of essay. And he took up something, it wasn't other people who had been talking about you know, the effect of automation on work. And he said, hey, this is a great opportunity. We've been longing for this for thousands of years. <coughs> for the burden of toil to be lifted. And the machines are making it possible. What are we going to do about it? That's really what we're He didn't, though. He didn't, though. It was too early to the history of the sun. He didn't be worried about the environment. Um, I think he would have been, but no one was uh, really at that time. And they all said, you know, they all looked forward to declining population. Thank you.